Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of The Soccer Sofa, hosted by myself, The Stod. And me, The Horse. This week, we've got a Republic of Ireland International, 50 caps, 5 goals. Add into that 550 club appearances and some amazing stats, such as he's been captain of every single club he's played for. Additionally, he's never received a red card. He could be the cleanest footballer we've ever met. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be here to interview him this week. So, Horse, are you good to take this one alone? Can't wait, Stod. Let's get him on. Roll VT! Captain for Roy Key. Holland. Fed up for a shot. Oh, he's got it! He has got it! Matt Holland has scored his first goal for Ireland. And Ireland are right back in this match in sensational style. That's a sensational strike. Fantastic strike by Matt Holland. But you know what we're talking about? Ireland falling into the trap of not getting tight on people and affording them a chance to shoot. It's exactly what the Portuguese did there. Welcome back for another week of Soccer Sofa. Uh, it's a real privilege this week to have Matt Holland on. Matt, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Not too bad surviving this lockdown. Ready for football to return. Well, it's back. We saw a couple of games at least. So, um, But I, I can't wait to get back to work myself and go to some of the matches. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you're, uh, you're sharing thoughts with, with millions of us at the moment. I, I'm certainly missing it. And I know a lot of our students are as well. Um, but while, while we're gradually easing back into football, um, it would be great to talk through your career and just remember some of the highlights that, that you had. Um, so a good, good place to start probably is what you were like back at school and as a school kid. Uh, were, were you a good school kid? <laughs> I'd like to think so. Yeah, my, my school reports weren't too bad. They were always not not bad at all. Um, I was reasonably okay at school. Did quite well in my GCSEs. Um, I think I've got nine A to Cs um, in my GCSEs, going back a fair few years now. Uh, so I was I wasn't a bad student. Uh, I tried to when I when I joined West Ham at sixteen. I tried to to carry on with my education as well. So I was going to night school as well, trying to do a couple of A levels, but. To be honest, the workload being an apprentice is, um, it was too much for me really. Uh, I was absolutely exhausted coming back from training and trying to go to college a couple of nights a week. I was struggling doing it. So lasted about three or four months doing it and decided it, it just wasn't for me that I needed to put all my attention into playing football really. So um, football was the passion. And, and like my dad said, when I left school at 16, you can always go back to your education. You have to follow sometimes your heart and, and follow your passion and um, football was for me so that was the I'll say my priority my priority was obviously school up until 16 and then football took over and I couldn't like my dad said I could always go back to it if I needed to. Yeah that, that's great I'm pleased um, the other player we've interviewed has kind of said that football turned their head uh, and school took a back seat but, but obviously that wasn't the case for you. Um, I mean, in your early days, I think Southampton was actually your your first club. Yeah, I was. I was. Um, they had a, a satellite centre, so I lived. I lived um, uh, well near Bishop Stortford, a place called Sorbridgeworth, and they had a, a satellite centre in Harlow. And so, just playing Sunday football, one of their scouts was watching one of the games and spoke to my dad about me coming down and training with them. And um, they actually, they actually made me a ma we went on a week's course down in Southampton, and they made me a mascot for one of the first team games uh, in a in a bid to try and get me to sign for them. Uh, I was only sort of nine or ten years old, uh, and Peter Shilton was the was the goalkeeper then at Southampton. So um, that was quite surreal. Uh, but yeah, that was so that was the first professional club that I was involved with at, at the age of eleven. Um, but as I say, they had a satellite centre near me. It was nowhere near Southampton. And, and then I think it was Arsenal next stop, wasn't it? How did did you get released from Southampton? Or no, I saw so, I, I got. Yeah, it was, well, it was a bit of, I suppose, a transfer. I got approached by Arsenal again playing, I think, representative football. It was like a League 11. And, uh, they were there watching a game, spoke to my dad, asked him I'd go and train with them. And so I decided to, to leave Southampton and go to, to Arsenal um, and did that. And then uh, I think about sort of 13, 14, they, they did release me, Arsenal, and said I was too small. It was a polite way, really, of telling a... 13, 14 year old that you're not quite good enough and um, it's an easier letdown I suppose than telling you that uh, so yeah that was that was pretty tough to take when you're sort of 13, 14 but 
I think it's a real test of character then. Um, and I always say to, to anyone who plays sport, you're going to get setbacks, you're going to get knockbacks, you're going to get told, you're not for us, you're not quite what we're looking for. Um, but it's up to you to go and prove that person wrong because invariably it's only one person's opinion. Um, so you have to you know, have the courage and the, the desire to, to try and prove them wrong. Um, fortunately, I was able to do that. Yeah, and I think you actually had a year out, so to speak, where you're playing sort of Sunday league football. Um, and was it Frank Senior, uh, Frank Lampard's dad, that, that picked you up in Sunday league? Is, is that correct? Yeah, again, just, well, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was a Sunday league game. It might have been, it might have been a county game because I was playing for Essex as well at the time. Uh, I don't, think you could, I don't think you could play for the, the county if you were associated with the club. And so I was, I was playing for um, Essex as well. And it might have been an Essex game, maybe. But he, anyway, he was, again, on the sideline, just a similar thing, really. Watched the game and then approached my dad afterwards and said, you know, come down and train, play a couple of games with us, which I did. Uh, and, and after sort of two or three games in their youth team at the age of 15, probably, um, they, they offered me a contract and... Um, yeah, so that was that was good, and then that was the decision made for me really in, in terms of leaving school and, and going taking on a ch the opportunity really to try and become a footballer. Sure, sure. And I think your dad was actually a non-league player himself. Was he more of a, a help or a hindrance uh, during this time? No, dad was good, really good. Um, don't don't get me wrong. We had some we had some tough car journeys home after matches and we had the the silent treatment and the arguments as as any parent i think and son do after after sport um but he was he took me here there and everywhere he was he was a real support uh and quite frankly i wouldn't have been a professional footballer without it without him taking me everywhere and and and, and being the the um the driver if you like to all those games i don't keep mr game until i was about 17 18 anyway so he he, he was at every match um but yeah, we had we had our moments and uh, silent car journeys, but it was it was all good. He was he was a good support, really. Uh, and of course, this now takes you up to sort of 17, 18 year old, um, and you were part of West Ham reserves, I think, at the time. Yeah, I was, I was, you know, first the first year I was at West Ham was was quite a difficult one. It, it was the transition from being you know training say once or twice a week to to going full time, uh, and my body was struggling a little bit with the demands you know I was still growing I was still quite I was still quite small at 16 and just sort of starting to have a bit of a growth spurt at that that time and uh, my body struggled for about the first four or five months just to just to cope with the demands of it really um, but the second year I was there I, I had a good season in the in the youth team started to force my way into the reserves 17 18 and and then um signed a professional contract at the end of those two years for a two-year professional contract so then I was starting to force my way into, into the reserves and and occasionally with the first team as well there was there was sort of you know Billy Bonds recognized I think one of the pre-seasons I came back maybe my first year as a professional um that I was sort of developed a bit more and I was starting to be at the top the front of the running and I, and I started to, be, to develop a bit more physically and started to take me in you know, with the first team on some of the pre-season tours and um, started to get into the squad a bit as well. So that was good experience for me. Um, so obviously West Ham, quite a famous academy. Some big names have been through there. Was there anyone else apart from yourself um, that was a standout name? Well, there was, a, there was a fair few. I mean, at my age, really, there was a lad called Danny Williamson who ended up being sold to Everton for about two and a half million, actually. Got in the first team at West Ham. Uh, but I think injury meant that he didn't sort of kick on with his career. Uh, but below us, you know, I'm sort of talking sort of three years, uh, there was Rio Ferdinand, Frank Lampard, Joe Cole, Michael Carrick. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of big names, a lot of players that have gone on to huge, huge things. And we were all aware of that as well, because there was a lot of talk around the place. You know, we've got, oh, we've got these young kids coming through. It's a really good age group. There's about, you know, three or four years below us. And all these players are all starting to come through at the same time. Um, but yeah, they, they all started to force their way into the, into the picture and, um, and all had brilliant careers. Um, I mean, this is something I've picked up from reading Frank Lampard's book. Uh, and he speaks about West Ham being quite a hostile place um, back then. Uh, and also particularly the stick he got because of his dad being the manager. Were, were you aware of, of any of this at the time? Was it sort of common knowledge in the club? Well, he, I mean, he did, he did get a bit of stick and um, 
to be honest, he was someone I admired because uh, he, there's nobody I, I've ever played with, I don't think, that had the same work ethic as, as Frank Lampard. He, um, when he was sort of coming through at, at the youth teams, um, everyone was aware that his dad was obviously assistant manager to Harry and, and people were accusing him of favouritism and um, because obviously Harry, I think, was his uncle as well. So there was all sorts of that going on. Um, but he used to train harder than anyone else I've seen. He used to stay behind when everyone was leaving. You know, there'd be the sniggers from some of the lads as, as we, were, we were walking out the gates and he was still out with his spikes on doing sprint training. Um, so I've got nothing but admiration, really, that, that for, for someone who has really got the very, very best and, and got the most out of his capabilities. So he's, he's got to the top, yes, talent, but a lot of hard work as well. Yeah, I think with, with football as a sport, that often gets overlooked. Um, I, I'm sure we're going to hear more of the hours that you had to put in to actually make it to the top. It, it doesn't just come on a plane. Well, um, well, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm, I'm not the most talented footballer that's ever walked the earth. I'm someone that, that relied on, on my attitude, really, and, and work rate, because I knew, I knew I wasn't the most gifted player the world's ever seen. So I had to work you know, hard. I mean, I would not, not maybe quite the same bracket as Frank Lampard, but um, in terms of his ethic and work, but I, I gave everything, everything I possibly could to become a professional footballer because I knew I had to. Uh, and of course, your your breakthrough wasn't far off. Um, certainly, uh, your your first uh, tr uh, experience of um, first team football was on loan at Farnborough, um, and I imagine this was probably the making of you. Really, how was that experience? It, excellent. I mean, I, Harry Redknapp was a big advocate of sending his players out on loan um, because when you're at a club like West Ham, you're at one of the top top teams you know everything's done for you you've got great facilities a great training ground um you've got uh, meals cooked for you your kits all washed everything's perfect when you go to a team that's in what's the what is the national league now uh, the, the old conference you, you know you you travel on a day of a game it might be four or five hours um you, you get you take your own kit home you you know it's, it's just a totally different world that that you're living in and it's a great it's a great learning curve and, and it's actually opens your eyes to what happens if you don't actually put the work in you don't make it in in one of the top teams then where you could end up playing your football and that, that was that was something that Harry Redknapp did with all these players Rio Ferdinand came to Bournemouth and I was down at Bournemouth Frank Lampard went to Swansea when they were down the down the leagues um so he was he it didn't matter who you were or, or, or how good he thought you were he always thought it was a good sort of learning curve really to go and play first team football and it, it did me the world good. Yeah I, I mean I'm sure you, you were playing with with guys that their mortgage was depending on winning and losing and, and staying in the league and keeping their job. Um, you, you, you're playing with all types of, of people I mean yes you're playing with, with people like that you're playing with people who've been in the league and dropped out of the league you're playing with a lot of experienced players I mean Graham Roberts, who used to play for Tottenham, he was at Enfield at the time. Um, so you're, playing up, you're coming up against people like that as well. And that's a good learning curve as well, because you imagine some of the physical challenges that yeah. some of those put in. And that league's renowned for being a bit more physical than perhaps the top level as well. So uh, that was a bit of an eye-opener. Yeah, I, I imagine they ruffled you up a bit when they saw a, a young kid um, coming into midfield from, from the glitzy West Ham. Um, but, but of course it all paid off because then your next loan move was Bournemouth, which I think is, would have been in the equivalent of League One at the time. Yeah. Uh, or Division Two or Three would have been Division Two back then. Yeah. So, it, it, yes, yeah, so it's what is the League, League One now. So that's, yes. Yeah, yeah, League One now. Yeah. Um, and of course, some tough times down in Bournemouth. Um, how was your time down there? It, it was... Um... It was a great, great club. I mean, I, I, when I left West Ham to go on loan at, at, to Bournemouth, uh, there was a few clubs that came in for me in that January. And um, Harry had obviously been manager at, Harry Redknapp I'm talking about now, had been manager at Bournemouth and he was the manager at West Ham. And he sort of said, oh, such and such room for you. Such a, but I think Bournemouth would be the right move for you. Um, but actually it was the right move for me because Mel Machen was the manager um, who had experience at the top clubs in, like Man City. 
And um, he was getting together a group of players, actually, that were in a similar position to me, really, who'd come from Tottenham, uh, been released or were being released and not quite going to make the grade at those clubs. Um, and there was a bit of a hunger about the team, a desire about the team, a young team that all got on really well. And he was, bit, you know, he, he was, when, when I first arrived, we were, oh, crikey, miles from safety. And it was, it, it, that first season was known as the great escape in Bournemouth's history because I think, I think they had something like 10 points at Christmas. And um, second half of the season, we had promotion form and, and ended up staying up. And it was a, a brilliant roller coaster. And that summer, I went back to West Ham and Harry was the manager and, and said, you know, he wanted me to stay, but it, I'll be down the pecking order. And I was at a stage now where I'd had a taste of first team football, didn't want to go back to playing reserve team football where it didn't really mean anything. Um, you've got two men and the dog watching the match. There's no real atmosphere at the games. I wanted to be playing in front of a crowd. I wanted to be playing where three points meant something. Um, so I said that I'd wanted to move. I think they had, a, they had a clause in the contract to say that they got a percentage of any sell on if, you know, if I move somewhere else. Um, so, so West Ham were happy with that. And I, and I made the move down to Bournemouth permanent because it was such a good move for me. And, uh, and the manager was great, Mel Machin. We had a really good relationship and he, he made me captain, uh, I don't know, probably six months, seven months into that season. And, um, he brought out leadership qualities in me really that that um well recognized i think the leadership qualities and we had we had good conversations and it, and it was um it really really interesting and, and excellent working with someone like that um and of course at the time i think it's no secret um there were buckets outside the ground to collect money for um i'm guessing to pay day-to-day -day costs at bournemouth um, as a player, does that influence whether or not you're, you're feeling this is a good move to go to a club like that? Yeah, it was tough at times. I mean, you know, you said about the National League and players playing to play, pay their mortgage and stuff. Well, we were a bit the same because we were young kids and I'd, I'd just taken on a place and had a mortgage myself and weren't getting paid for six, eight weeks at times. To you know, And that was tough when you've got you know, bills to pay at the end of a month and, and you, you're waiting on your wages to be paid by the club. Uh, that was that was hard going, um, and there was one particular game where we we were given the the uh, decision to make by the administrators whether to play a game or not against Bristol City. And if we didn't play, the club would have folded. Um, but to a man, actually, every single player said no, nope, we'll play. And we actually went and beat Bristol City the next day. It was um, yeah, amazing, really. But it, that's how close it came to to being. No, the football club being um, not existent anymore. So it was, um, it was, yeah, pretty tricky times. And actually, my my sale by moving to Ips Ipswich helped help the, the club survive at that time. Um, what always amazes me about this time is Bournemouth still had some really decent players on their books. Um, Eddie Howe is one that springs to mind, and I think Rio Ferdinand was in the side that you were in when you were down there. Um, how did they manage that? How can you attract that calibre of player when you're struggling at the bottom with, with no money? Well, Eddie had, Eddie had um, come through the ranks there anyway. So he'd been a, a, you know, a youngster coming through the, um, the academy and into the first team there. Uh, I mean, people like Rio, again, he, he was at West Ham and Harry was the manager. So it was, a, you know, he put, and Jermaine Defoe, I think, followed him after I'd left as well. Jermaine Defoe went down to Bournemouth after I'd um, uh, gone to Ipswich. So it, it, it helps when you've got that connection, you know, and someone who's, who's a manager at a top club has been there previously and managed at Bournemouth. It, it helps that they can um, provide you one or two decent players. And, and, um, and, and I'm sure West Ham would have been paying the majority of his wages as well. Uh, uh, yes, of course. Um, okay. And then you, you've already touched on it. Your move from Ipswich, sorry, to Ipswich from Bournemouth. Um, I can't remember the exact figure. I, I've seen something in my head, 800,000. Um, yeah, that's right. From, from Bournemouth to uh, Ipswich. Uh, talk us through that move. Did you have any other offers at the time? Well, the club were in financial trouble, had to sell. Uh, and uh, probably at the time, without sounding big-headed really, I was probably the most saleable asset. And, and they did have a few offers. The administrator said to me that they... Um, uh, had a lot of derisory offers 
because I think they realised the club was in financial trouble and were, were trying to get me on the cheap. And there was a, it, it took a long time for that deal to be done or, or a fee to be um, agreed. And, and eventually I was given permission to speak to George Burley. He came down to Bournemouth and he, we met in the, the Royal Bath Hotel right on the seafront at Bournemouth. And uh, I mean, I grew up watching a lot of football and, and Ipswich were one of the top teams, late 70s, early 80s. Some of the players that they had that won the FA Cup in 78, won the UEFA Cup, you know, they, they, they were a proper team. And when George Burley, who was a part of that side as well, comes down, starts talking about the history of the club and the players that have played for the club, where he sees the club going in the future, you know, my head was sort of turned straight away. And, and it, was a, it was a no-brainer for me to make the move. Um, and I, went, I remember going back to my girlfriend at the time, wife now, saying, I'm moving to Ipswich. And um, she said, do I not get a say in this? Well, I said, I'm going. I said, I'd like you to come. I said, but I, I, I'm going. And um, fortunately, she made the move. And, and uh, so, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, I think it's another thing we forget with footballers in that you move around everywhere and um, keeping that stability in your personal life probably is, is challenging at times. Yeah, it can, it can be. I mean, you know, I was lucky actually that I, throughout my career, I didn't really move around too much. And so my, my children were able to be settled at schools and weren't sort of uprooted every year and being put in different schools. That was something I was pretty lucky with really. But for some, it, it's horrendous. You know, some move every year and, and you know, all over the country. That, that must be really difficult. But I, I fortunately wasn't in that, that position where I moved my kids too much. Yeah, and of course, um, this was the start of a very successful time of, of a club that I imagine you now call home. Um, uh, and how was it in that first season at Ipswich? You were thrown in at the deep end, really. I think you played 59 games in your first season as a 23-year-old. Probably something like that, yeah. I was, I was um, straight in the team and, and luckily enough, I got player of the year that first year, which, which you know, gets you off to a, a good start, really, with, with the home support. Um, it took us a while to get going that season. And um, we, we were... Actually, when I signed, George Burley originally play, picked up or signed me to play as a, as a sweeper in a back three. But when we could, I went into midfield and made you know um we went to a back four and I went into midfield so he, he was trying to be tactically flexible Steve Sedgley had done it for him the season before and he wanted me to he, I'd played at the back for Bournemouth as well as in midfield and he wanted me to do that role um but then about 10 games in I think uh eight, eight to 10 games in we played Stoke at home and he put me in midfield and I, I scored and then I, the following game he played me in midfield against Torquay in the cup and I scored twice and that was it then really I I he picked me in midfield after that moment. I mean, I probably had too much energy really to be playing at the back. And I think he recognised that, that, you know, it, it, I was not wasted, but I, I could get about the pitch. And he, um, and after those sort of first 10 games, I ended up playing midfield really. And then uh, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it was three consecutive seasons, uh, Ipswich were in the playoffs. Um, how do you pick yourself up each time from that? Yeah, that's not, it's not easy, actually. It's not easy. I mean, I, I lost two semi-finals before we eventually got promoted in the third year, but they'd lost in the semi-finals before I was there as well. But that, that obviously didn't mentally scar me particularly, but the, the first two. Um, after the first year we lost in the playoffs, I got married. After, <laughs> uh, after, the, after we lost in the semi-final second year, we had uh, Sam... Sam was born, our son, um, and then the third year we won. So I was able to I was able to quite quickly pick myself up because I had sort of big personal things going on yeah. in my life. But um, football is football generally. You have more lows and you have highs. You have some great moments throughout your career, but you do have a lot more lows and you have highs. And so um, you have to be able to somehow um, try and put them to one side and, and and move on quickly because the next one's coming up. Uh, although, albeit at the end of the season, it, it's not easy. But as I say, I had a couple of things in my personal life that were going on, which were quite big things. So it managed to take my attention away from what had gone on wrong on the pitch. And I think um, the, the team you saw the most in the playoffs was Bolton, who you lost in your first, uh, I think it was the playoff final you got Bolton in that, in that first year that you were there? We, we lost, I think we lost to Charlton in the first year. My, my, I think they lost to Sheffield United the year I got before I got there. They lost to uh, 
but uh, Charlton in the first year I was there, Bolton the next year, uh, and um, we lost and then on you a, beat Bolton in the, the and then we. Then we then we beat them in no then we beat them in the semi final. Oh sorry, yeah, but yeah, in the, the semi final following it. Yeah, the, the fourth year that you went up. Fourth year, that's right. And I, I think uh, reading on some of the research I did on the game, um, Sam Allardyce is still fuming now after was it seven five on um, on aggregate uh, that he got promoted. Then what what was particularly controversial in that? In uh, we, he wasn't happy. I think that we we got given a couple of penalties, and um, he didn't like some of the decisions that were going against his team. Um, but oh well, ba Barry Knight was the, Barry Knight was the referee, and he's still on my Christmas card list. Oh, is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that says a lot. Then there must have been a little bit of truth in that. No, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Of course. <laughs> um, and of course, now you're starting to get um, attention at an international level. Uh, I think your Republic of Ireland call-up came in 99. Um, there's a, a few things I've picked up uh, along the way is um, you're obviously, you sound very English, you were brought up in England um, you were, and you became a Republic of Ireland international. Did you ever find points of your career that people um, made remarks about that or has that just, just been the way it is? No, 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 I didn't actually. Um, to be honest, you know, there was a lot of players prior to me ever playing for Ireland that had gone down the same route. People had been born in England, um, you know, and used the, the grandparent rule, if you like. Um, so that was, it was quite a common thing. You know, Jack Charlton had been English and had been the manager of the Republic of Ireland, been very successful. Um, so when I, when I was in the squad, I mean, out of a 23-man squad, you're probably you're talking at least 10, 11 at, at uh, the Irish accents like mine. Um, <laughs> so, so no, it was, it, it was never, never a thing at all, really. It, it was never, never, ever an issue. And was there any, was there ever a point where you were thinking uh, I'd like to play for England or was it more, was it always Ireland or Republic of Ireland or, or was it um, just whoever sort of shouted loudest? Well, to, to be honest, I mean, I'd, I'd had no international recognition coming, you know, at all. Um, and I was always aware, you know, of my Irish heritage. It was, it was, you know, made very clear to me, you know, growing up. Um, and Mick McCarthy got in touch and, and phoned me at home and I had absolutely no hesitation. It was, it was literally, uh, well, was it, well, I had hesitation because I wasn't sure it was Mick McCarthy on the phone. <laughs> when, it, when, he, when he phones you at home and you think it's one of the lads, to be honest, who's messing about and pretending to be Mick McCarthy. But, uh, so that was my only hesitation. But as soon as he, he, um, he sort of said that the fixture that was coming up and wanted me to fly over and play, and it was a B international, actually. And, um, and that was it, really, for me. Uh, my mind was made up and, and I had no hesitation. And the first game, I think, was uh, Macedonia. Um, but not really a debut to remember results-wise, is, is that fair to say? Yeah, well, we needed to win to qualify, and uh, I came on with about 10 minutes to go, 1-0 up, and they actually scored in the 94th minute, and um, I remember, you know, thinking, wow, you know, what's sort of going on here, really? Uh, and I remember actually reading Mick's book afterwards, he said, uh, you know, Matt Holland had his debut, and I, he must have been thinking, what on earth is going on? And, you know, but you know, he, he was quick to sort of put his arm around and say, it wasn't my fault or anything. I mean, I was nowhere near it. it was a, I was on the edge of the box when you know, it was a corner and the head of, head of they scored, I think, in the 94th minute. Um, but it was a yeah, pretty sour taste, really, and, and the, it was um, not a good atmosphere. Uh, but um, it, my big breakthrough came the following year, to be honest, in the, in the US Cup. I played three games in the following summer, after we'd got just after we'd got promotion, actually, with Ipswich. And... Um, those three games really were the three games that cemented my position in the squad. There was a lot of players we were missing, um, but I played 90 minutes in all three games and, and I think did all right. So that was really what, what, um, what meant I was starting to be a bit more permanent fixture in the squad. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, the, 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 the obvious thing is this international call-up sort of tied in quite nicely with Ipswich's rise up um, and promotion into the Premier League. So that, that first season in the Premier League, when you were a fully fledged international player, um, I mean, what a couple of years you must have had there, 99, 2000, 2001. Um, how was that first season? Yeah, I mean, we, we well, we, we got promotion through the playoffs. Um, 
and beat Barnsley at Wembley, which was a you know a pretty special thing. It was the last ever club game at at, um, at the old Wembley um, before they knocked it down, and and then they started playing the finals at the Millennium Stadium, um, rebuilding the new Wembley. So that was it. Was great to to obviously be a part of history there, um, and then. Uh, I mean, when we when we first got promoted, the first game we played, we played Tottenham first game in the season, and we we got beat three one. But we went one 0 up ten minutes into the game, and then with a couple of mistakes, and we ended up losing the game three one. It was actually a bit of a rude awakening. It was a it was an eye opener for us. You know, they had a twenty million striker in Rebroff, and you know, had real had real quality in the squad, and we made a couple of mistakes, and they took advantage of it, and it and it was a lesson for us uh, at White Hart Lane. The next game we played Man United with the champions, and uh, we drew the game one all, and and I remember Sir Alex Ferguson had to change his tactics it, mid game because he was struggling to get a hold of the ball and he was getting frustrated with what was happening. Uh, and we played really well that night, and and that probably gave us the confidence, I think, to to say actually we'll be all right at this level. We can we can do okay here. Um, we had a lot of good players. I mean George Burley, I think one of his biggest strengths was was an eye for a player, someone who could pass. He, he, always said we've got to pass the ball and it, we did passing drills every single day in training um so he had a good eye for a play and we had a good team a good togetherness and a good spirit but that game against man united was the catalyst i think because that gave us the real belief that we could belong at that level yeah i mean some incredible results in that season i've got that you beat united and i think that was at old trafford um you beat liverpool at anfield uh, and you beat Everton as well. Any of those really stand out in your mind as um, games that you'll never forget? I don't think I beat. I don't think we beat United because I don't think I ever got a result at Old Trafford. So oh, I don't right. think maybe it's the draw we, then. It, I've been the draw that we had at home, but we um, we we did beat Liverpool. We did beat Everton, and those two games do stand out. We had Marcus Stewart in brilliant form, and he was one of the top English scorers. I think maybe even the top yeah. English scorer of that yeah, season. Yeah, I think he was. I mean, Obviously, behind Thierry Henry, and the... and he got 19 goals in the Premier League, which was a great, obviously a great return. And when you've got a goal scorer, it helps. Um, and that I remember really well. But the Everton game stands out for me the most, actually, because I think that was probably our most complete performance over over the course of the season. And afterwards, the game finished, and and you know, often when you a home team's been beaten like that, they get especially to a promoted team, the the home team get booed off. And well, actually, they. The Everton fans all stayed and applauded us off the pitch, and that that will stick with me forever because that was a great moment. You know, when when a, a home crowd like that can recognise that we've gone there and put in a performance that we did, and they applaud you off the pitch, that says that you've you've done pretty well. So that that really stands out that season. Yeah, yeah, quite a moment, and fair play to them for recognising uh, the performance you'd put in. Um, I think there was also quite a comical moment that I I came across. Um, which was uh, interaction between you and Gaza um, and something in his hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually got his shirt from the game against Everton. Um, but yeah, he, there was a break in play uh, 25 minutes into the game, half an hour into the game, an injury and the referee sort of stood to the side of what's going on. And um, we we're just chatting away, waiting for play to continue really because we we're next to each other in midfield. And um, as I looked down, I looked on his hand and it had Holland 8 written on the back of his hand. And I was sort of did a double take and, and just gave him the nudge. I said, what's, what's all that? He said, honestly, he said, I forget who I'm supposed to be marking. He said, the manager, the manager makes me write it down. So at set pieces, I know who I'm supposed to be picking up. He said, because he tells me and tells me and tells me. And I just always forget. He said, so I write it down and then I can make sure that I look and make sure I've got the right person when I'm marking at set pieces. So it was amazing. <laughs> amazing, really. Yeah. God knows what goes through his head. Um, and then, of course, you were having a, uh, a really good season in the Premier League and we get through the, it's the qualifiers um, and there was a, a huge game against Holland. Uh, what, I mean, the first thing that sticks in my mind from that game is the crunching tackle uh, from Roy Keane to sort of set, set the game going. Um, how does that game stick in your memories? Uh, what, what were the... Well, it was... About? It was a brilliant qualifying campaign. I mean, we we uh, were third seeds, and when you've got Holland and Portugal in your group, there weren't a lot of expectations on us really. Um, it, uh, the first two games were Holland away and Portugal away in the group, and we drew in Holland, drew two all, and we were two nil up in the game. And and I remember Roy Keane being absolutely fuming that we hadn't held on, and he was absolutely right because we. 
for long periods with a better side. And then Portugal away, I'd scored. Um, we drew what we drew one all, and that was two, so two big results to get us off and running. Um, but we needed to beat someone at home really to to make sure that we finished above, you know, um, at least in the playoff positions. And then the Holland game came along, and and you're right, Roy Key made a crunching tackle against Overmars. Actually, he gets lauded for that performance against Holland and. And look, Roy Keane's an immense player and he was brilliant that day. But actually, I think the game against Portugal at home, he was even better. I think that was his best performance, the, the game against Portugal. We ended up drawing that one one all as well, but he scored that day against Portugal. Uh, but the Holland game, he crunched Mark Overmars. It set the tone. Lansdowne cro- ro- Road crowd were up and, and roaring. Gary Kelly gets sent off. So we're down to 10 men. Um, Steve Finham puts the ball into McAteer and it goes wild. He scores. We, went, we go one nil up. Uh, Louis van Gaal was the manager of Holland and I think he made a couple of ch- changes. He made some silly tactical changes. I think, looking back, he, he had two wide men off and two strikers. So he had four strikers on the pitch at one time. So he had no supply line, but he had four strikers at the top of the pitch. So it didn't really work for them. And, and um, Albeit they threw the kitchen sink at us. They, you know, we had a few hairy moments, don't get me wrong. We managed to hold on and beat them 1-0. It's probably one of the best atmospheres I've, I've ever seen at, at Lansdowne Road. And um, that meant that we were going to be in the playoffs at the very least still had a chance of qualifying automatically but I think Portugal had a fairly comfortable easy game I think we had Cyprus they might have had Estonia um, they were expected to win they ended up winning it as well and beating us on goal difference um, to, the, to the top of the group so they qualified automatically we went into the playoffs and we played Iran in the playoffs and um, fortunately got the job done over two legs and, and meant we qualified for the um, World Cup in 2002 Yeah I mean I think uh, particularly that that side you were in, um, it's kind of one of those you look back on and you realise in hindsight what a great side it was. Um, like so Steve Finnan, yourself, Damien Duff, um, McAteer, uh, and they were great players. Just you were kind of the underdogs all the time, but you seemed to thrive under that label. Yeah, I mean, we were actually underdogs going into the into the World Cup as well because. We were again third favourites, really, to come out of the group. I think Cameroon had won. I think they'd won the Olympic title, and certainly African Cup of Nations champions as well, going into the into the World Cup. Uh, Germany, of course, everyone sort of knows what when it comes to a major tournament, they turn up, um, uh, and then Saudi Arabia and ourselves. So we were the third favourites in that group to, to come out of it. Um, so again, we were we were underdogs, and, and without Roy Keane as well because of of what had happened prior to the tournament. So there was perhaps not as much expectation on us then either. Um, but we did have good players, and you know we had players that played Champions League football. You know Leeds, for instance, Ian Hart and Gary Kelly, Steve Finn, and won the Champions League with Liverpool. Uh, you know, I mean, Robbie Jay Given is, is Jay Given in goal. Yeah. Robbie Keane, Damian Duff. You know, you're talking about some really top players. So it's um, yeah, we were we were a decent side. We did we didn't get off to the best best of starts really against Cameroon. The first half wasn't very good, and, and I remember Mick coming in at half time and having a, a real go at us really because his mantra coming into the World Cup had been no regrets, and we had posters all around the walls saying no regrets all around the hotel, no regrets. And at half time, he said, "That's all we've got is regrets." He said, "You know, we haven't we haven't really turned up." Um, and second half, we came out and, and um, we were a different team. And and from that moment on, we we sort of. I felt I felt we were in the tournament then. Yeah, and I think I'm right in saying that. That did you score the goal against Cameroon? Yeah, I scored against Cameroon, so we drew one all and, and one nil down at half time, and um, we equalised sort of I don't know just just before the hour mark, I think. And um, yeah, it's, oh, it's mental, really. I mean, scoring in the World Cup, it's like it, you, you dream of playing in a World Cup and then to, to score as well. It's the ultimate, to be honest. And you lose yourself and you don't know what you're doing and you don't know where you're celebrating and all those things. And then and then you sort of get your head around it and, and you think, right, well, let's go and win the game now because we were on top at that time. You know, as soon as the game kicked off again, you have to sort of quickly bring yourself back down to earth and, and focus on the job in hand. But that's not easy either when you've, when you've just scored in a World Cup. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, and of course, you, you've touched on it already, and I don't want to go on about it too much. Um, but the Roy Keane incident, um, what sparked that all off? What was the, the problem that uh, got him so upset? I mean, it's again, it's something I've, I've, we've 
talked many times about and uh, or i've talked many times about it, it, it i mean roy had a lot of valid points you know the when we got there the training ground wasn't particularly good the kit hadn't arrived on time there's lots of things that you know he had a, a valid reason to be upset about to be honest um i think nick was upset about the way he he went about um uh, you know went about sort of saying he wasn't happy about things and I think he did an article in one of the newspapers in Ireland and which Mick wasn't particularly happy about either um, and it and it just was a row that escalated and unfortunately it escalated too far and um, uh, and that was you know a, a bit of a, a difficult moment really and I think that probably contributed as really to us to us having a slow start to, to the, the tournament um, he, he was the he was the one player that I think any other team in the world would have wanted out of our side. If you said you can pick one, t one player at the Republic of Ireland team, most other managers at that World Cup would have said, I'll have Roy Keane because he was that good a player. So to lose him was a big blow. But, you know, you, you have to come together. And I said, you know, setbacks, adversity, you have to, you have to sort of um, recognise that and, and move on from it quite quickly. And, and that's what we did. That's what, you know, the other 22 players had to get on with the job in hand and um, unfortunately we were able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it almost brought the squad together. Um, so obviously Roy left and, and that um, togetherness of the squad seemed to pull you through the group stages um, and out into the knockouts. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we, we obviously came from behind against uh, Cameroon came from behind against Germany in the second game as well, we scored a late goal. Robbie Keane scored an equaliser in that one. Uh, and then we we got the job done against Saudi Arabia, we won 3-0 and, and it was quite a comfortable evening really uh, before we, we met Spain in the knockout stages. So yeah, there was, there was a good togetherness, there was a good spirit and um, it, it was you know, not easy. It was a, a difficult few days, a difficult week maybe uh, and, and we were itching to get the tournament underway. Once it did, I think we, was, we settled into it. Uh, and of course, you, you've, We've already touched on this highs and lows in football. You, you got um, through to penalties against Spain after a one-all draw and extra time, um, and you stepped up to take a penalty and, and missed. Um, how how do you deal with something like that as a player, and, and how does that feel? I know that's it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's weird, really, when you go from your highest point in football to your lowest point in football in the space of about two weeks. Which mm. you know, scoring the World Cup is it's the pinnacle missing a penalty in the world cup it's the low and um it, it was hard it was tough uh, um, i took eight penalties in my career it wasn't a regular penalty taker i took eight penalties in my career i placed seven and i blasted one the one i blasted it was the one in the world cup and it's the only one i missed in hindsight i wish i i wish i had placed it but my mind was made up I, you know when you're walking up to the, the ball and i can picture the walk now it's a it's a long way from the halfway line to that penalty spot when you, you know, and um but my mind was made up. I was going to blast it, and maybe adrenaline, maybe the, the you know whatever it might have been, has got too much, and it hit the crossbar and went over the top. So, um, I, in hindsight, probably regret you know blasting it. Maybe should have placed it, but my mind was made up, and I wasn't going to change my mind. I got called for a drugs test as soon as the game finished, so I was straight off the pitch. And myself and Robbie Keane were the two players from Ireland that had been selected to go and do the drugs test. So that was that was a nightmare going in and having to spend another two and a half hours without even being able to go in the dressing room and see the lads and and you know try and commiserate commiserate each other afterwards. Uh, and then when I got back to the hotel, I remember because my wife had been at, at the tournament for the first couple of games, but had flown back home. You know, obviously not sure how far we were going to go and got the kids' school and all sorts. So um, she she uh, she went had gone back. So I remember being on the phone to her, being in tears and all sorts and and actually kevin kilban uh he came to the room and said right we're all going out we, you know we're going to go have a few beers and we're going to you know, um you know go and have a bit of a, a downtime because we hadn't had any downtime for, for six weeks and we've been qu quite full on with it all and i said no no absolutely fine you know you crack on i said but i'm just going to stay here i can't really face it and anyway he he, he was adamant and actually i you know, something i'll always be thankful for because you know, i think we needed that and it was it's not easy to put the back of your mind, but, no. that, but, but just, just for that time, it, it was a great thing for, for, to be able to go out and just let your hair down a bit, have a couple of beers with the rest of the squad. And um, I will be forever grateful that he came and knocked on my door that night. Uh, I think it was also quite a nice touch that 
normally when you have a drugs test, you, you get a car back afterwards, but didn't the bus, the bus waited for you for, for two and a half hours, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. Actually, you know, I, quite often you would ordinarily expect the team just to go back, go and have something to eat at the hotel. And, and, um, those that, you know, didn't have to be around for two hours, but they did. They waited in the concourse underneath the ground for, well, until we were finished. And, and you know, um, so that was, that was, I think that just demonstrates really the togetherness of the squad and, and how united we were really that yeah, if, if we're all in it together, you know, and, and I think there was, well, there was, there was three of us that missed penalties. It wasn't, I think that's probably makes it a little bit easier. The fact that you weren't the only one, or you weren't the, the one that missed the penalty that meant that was us done. So that perhaps, perhaps makes it a fraction easier to deal with. But even now, I, I still uh, I still don't want to ever watch it again. No, uh, and I don't blame you. Uh, I, watched the, I watched the goal against Cameroon a few times, but not yeah. the <laughs> Yeah, he needs sort of a, a pick-me-up afterwards. Um, yeah, but and then it was back, sort of a bit of a reality check, back to the, the Premier League. Um, and of course, I'm just getting my, my years right. Um, 2000, 2001, so before the World Cup, was qualifying for the UEFA Cup. Um, so in that season as well, you, you were playing the UEFA Cup games. Um, I can imagine, I mean, Portman Road must have been absolutely um, buzzing when these games are on. Um, what was that like as an, as an experience? Well, when we beat Inter Milan at home, it was absolutely rocking. And um, you, you'll do well to ever replicate that noise again. Um, look, the club Ipswich had, had been synonymous with, with European football and, as I say, champions of UEFA Cup in, in 82 as well. So they had a history of it um, and, a, and a brilliant record at Portman Road as well in European competition it was something that we were aware of as well. And um, so that game against Inter Milan was, was massive. Alan Armstrong header, we beat them 1-0 and we went to the San Siro. We ended up getting beat 4-1. Christian Vieri scored a hat-trick and uh, I think he scored a hat-trick after about 50 minutes, then pointed to the bench and said his night was done. He went off and Brazilian, Brazilian Ronaldo came on. It was, it, 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 it was like the big guns had come to play really when, when we went away from home. They didn't, they didn't particularly travel, I don't think, that well and didn't enjoy the, the, the atmosphere at Portman Road, but they, uh, they, they obviously did at, San, at the San Siro. And it, but it was a great experience, you know. It, it was, um, you want to test yourself against the best players. You want to play at the highest level and, and obviously playing for Ireland at the World Cup and playing for Ipswich in, in European competition and playing in the Premier League. They, they were things that you, you dreamt of as, as a child and um, you know, it was, it's great that they were able to come true. Yeah, I, I have a feeling the Ipswich fans probably don't really care that you lost away. It was the important one was was winning at home, um, in, in front of in front of a packed house, um, and of course, uh, yeah, that season um, the UEFA Cup when you got up to fifth in the league, um, it was obviously a really good core group of players and it was a great team spirit. Um, that next season. Um, when in the league, you, you really struggled. Do you think this was partly due to lots of new faces coming in um, and not that core of, of uh, hard, hard-working players that had got you so far the season before? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to pick any individuals out and, and, and say it was their fault particularly, but you know, players did come in for big money, on big money, and I think it did disrupt the, the harmony in the dressing room. Uh, so that didn't help. I think there'd be a fair few players and myself included who held a hand up and said we didn't have as good a season that year. I think the European competition hampered us as well because uh, we Thursday, Sunday, we were a smaller squad. You know, some squads were able to deal with it. Some some squads used to have two teams that, you know, you could play 11 on Thursday and a different 11 on the Sunday in the league as well. We weren't able to do that, didn't have that luxury. So we travel away from home, play a game, say, Thursday away in in, in Europe, not get back till late Friday, uh, train again Saturday morning, travel Saturday to go to Newcastle away and, or whatever it might have been. And I think that affected us a bit as well. So I think there was a number of contributing factors to why things went wrong that following season. Yeah, and um, I, I mean, there's no secret that you played a lot of games every season. Um, and I think I saw a stat, something like 259 appearances 
without missing a game or 259 consecutive appearances. Just how were you managing that? How were you avoiding injury? Well, I had a bit of luck. I mean, I, you know, you can't go that long without, you know, picking up the odd injury here and there. Um, but I I was fortunate in that if I picked up a knock on a Saturday, and if we'd have had a midweek game, I would have probably missed it. I was able to get myself, I had weeks maybe to get myself fit for the following weekend. So there was a, there was a bit of luck. There was a, a desire to play every game. You know, there was, there was games I played that maybe I, I shouldn't have done. Um, I, I probably would have been advised not to have done by the physio, but the physio knew what I was like and knew that I wanted to play. So it, it, we, we had a, not an arrangement, but we had a, we, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't force his hand. But if I, if I didn't think I was going to get through the game, I wouldn't have, I, you know, I wouldn't have played. But um, there was, yeah, so there was a few moments like that. Um, George Burley wanted me to play. I mean, as well. So we, you know, we had a few sort of, I say, fitness tests. I mean, they were, they were, they were laughable, really. I mean, I was on one leg a couple of times, and he said, "Oh, you'll be all right." And and I said, "Yeah, yeah I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Give me an injection. I'll be away. It'll be, it'll be fine." So there was a bit of luck and a bit and a bit of a, a hunger to play as well. Yeah, I often hear these media bulletins of players passing late fit, fitness tests. Is it literally sort of a lap of the bus and? I, no, no. Generally, generally, they are quite quite strenuous, and they are designed to sort of test you and, and how you be in a game. But I mean, I did have a couple in a car park, really, just outside the bus. You know, where I mean, I didn't do anything. I threw a few balls out. I had, I jumped off my bad ankle a couple of times, and and, and I, I sort of grimaced, and he would look at each other and he'd go, "Yeah, you'll be all right." And I went, "Yeah, I'll be fine. Just we'll strap it up. We'll be okay." So. Um, but there was, yeah, there was a couple of laughable, laughable fitness tests, to be honest. Uh, I guess a good manager, as, as Burley obviously was, and, and he knew you, um, you judge it by the player rather than... I think you have to have that, I think you have to have that relationship as well. I think you have to have that, that um, uh, confidence in each other that, you, you know, and, and he, he knew that, you know, even if I was sort of, 70 80 percent I'd, I'd give my all and, and still try and get through the game so um yeah there was there was that confidence in each other with it as well um and then of course that season led to relegation um you had a couple of offers on the table i think villa was the one that they um they actually accepted provided you were willing to accept um was there anyone else on the table that came in at that time uh I can't remember. I mean, again, it's again, it's a fee, really. It's a fee it, it, for the club. It was just about getting the biggest fee, and, and Aston Villa offered the most money. And again, that was why I spoke to them. And and the, or the, the club had a figure in mind, I guess. And and if if it was reached, then that I was allowed to speak to clubs, and Aston Villa reached that that figure. Um, but it was a strange one, really, because Graham Taylor was the manager, and I'd, I had a four-year contract left at Ipswich, but they only offered me a three-year deal to go. I had, um, uh, I would have turned 30 in the, in the third year and the money that they offered me went down after two years in that third season, but only offered me a three year deal. And I said, look, if you could, if you want me to come, then obviously you're going to have to show me the commitment and, and, you know, make me a, an offer of, uh, at least that matches what I was on at Ipswich really. And, and they weren't able to do that. And Graham Taylor was quite apologetic. Actually, it was Doug Ellis was the chairman at Aston Villa and he just wouldn't budge on it. That was his, his thing. And he was quite, sort of tunnel visioned with it as well. Um, so Graham Taylor said, I've, I've done everything I possibly can to twist his arm, he said, but he's just not moving. So that, that unfortunately meant it didn't happen. I think there's sort of an unwritten rule, isn't there, of players over the age of 30 being harder to, to resell? Oh, yeah. I mean, there would have been no real resale value. That's the thing as well. You know, if you, there's a big outlay initially, then you, you're going to want maybe some, some return on your money. And, and I guess turning 30 would have meant that 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 wouldn't have been the case, and um, if if both of me a three year deal, you know they could have perhaps at thirty maybe tried to sell me on then and and still recoup some money. Who knows? But yeah, it, it just you know for whatever reason the move just didn't materialise. And then you you've uh, been relegated back to the championship, or back then I think maybe Division One it was called. Um, how was that going back for that season? Was it a bit of a, a reality check? Well, it was. A, 
I mean, uh, the championship's tough. Forty-six games. Uh, that's not easy. Um, but I had, I felt like a uh, not an obligation, but but um, after being relegated and maybe not playing as well, you know, myself that season we went down, and um, I felt like I had a bit to prove and wanted to get the club back to where I felt we belong now. You know, after a couple of seasons in the Premier League, I felt that's where I wanted to be with them, and, and I wanted to get I wanted to play a part in getting the club back to to um, the Premier League. Um, unfortunately, we we got off to a bad start. George lost his job. Joe Rule came in, and we had a bit of a surge, and we ended up just just missing out on the playoffs. I think we finished seventh, and that was it. Then, the, the, you know, David Sheepshanks was the chairman at Ipswich, and he, he he basically said to me that summer, "You won't be here next year." He said, "We we simply can't afford to keep you, and we we need to you know we need to bring some money, and so you, you are going to be sold." Um, and and I, I spoke to Charlton and Portsmouth that summer before eventually signing for Charlton. Your time towards the, it was coming to its end at Ipswich. Um, there's one stat, that another stat, your, your career is full of quite interesting stuff. <laughs> um, and I almost call this the Gary Lineker stat. Um, very few, I think Gary Lineker's stat was he didn't get any yellow cards, but you never had any sending offs and you didn't seem to get that many yellow cards either. Um, are there any that stand out in your mind that you thought, I kind of got away with that one a bit. Yeah, yeah, I got one. Um, yeah, I, I always, I felt I was you know, time tackles quite well. I thought, you know, people say, "Oh, you probably didn't tackle," but I think I did, and I think I was a wholehearted player. And I, but I felt like I was quite good. At, it was one of my assets, really. I could time a tackle. Um, but one, I went slightly over the top at Sunderland against Alex Trey. He went high, and I ended up going a little bit higher, not not deliberately, and there was no. There was no real malice in it, but there's two of us coming together and the studs were up and I, and I got a yellow card and probably in hindsight, if, if I didn't have maybe the reputation that I had or was, you know, the, 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 um, the chat with the referees at times, then I, I maybe would have been sent off. Uh, Peter Reid actually was the son of the manager and, he, you know, he was renowned actually for some of his, his tackles throughout his career and he was brilliant after the game. He was brilliant after the game. He, he, he actually backed me in the press conference and so... Um, it was it, it it was one that sort of blew away quite quickly, but it was a yeah. I mean, I've I've not seen it back, but I, I knew at the time well, I could be in trouble here. And um, when I saw the yellow straight away, the referee ran over the yellow. I thought, oh, I might have got away with that one. And yeah, so that was the one really. Yeah, I guess one out of your six seven hundred appearances is uh, it's not too bad going. No, okay, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't get booked too much either. Um, I got more bookings after I turned 30 when I was a little bit slower and then I couldn't quite get there. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, a bit of shirt tugging just to slow the game down. Yeah. Um, and, of course, next move was almost your second home. Uh, Charlton Athletic came in for you. Um, and actually, you know, some really good seasons here at Charlton. I, I'd for, actually forgotten the, the seventh place finish um, in the league. And uh, you were pushing for... Champions League places at one point. Um, I think you finished just in the UEFA for cup places. Um, and you were under, working under a great manager, Alan Kerbishley. How, how was your time in that, particularly that first season? Yeah, good. I mean, I, a great club. I mean, I, we've come against each other in the playoffs. I've come up against Charlton a number of times as well for, for Ipswich in the league. Uh, had some good battles with them. Uh, I'd actually met Alan Kerbishley on holiday three or four years previous as well. And um, when... He, he, we actually, he said, oh, when I, I thought about buying you from Bournemouth, he said, many years ago, he said, but I thought you were a bit expensive at the time. Um, he, and then... Always he liked a deal. Yeah, he wanted a deal. He said, I thought you might be a bit expensive for me. He said, so I didn't, I didn't buy you. He said, but maybe I should have done it. So we had a good, good chat. Anyway, um, so I, I ended up signing for him at Charlton. And he actually made me captain at my first season. So we've gone through it through pre-season and, and um, the last pre-season game against Orient, he, he gave me the armband. I was a bit like taken away, and it, but, but he made me captain as well. Um, we were going well. We, we were, I think, fourth around Christmas and um, Scott Parker was a big player for us, but he moved in January and he went to Chelsea. That affected us a bit because he was such a good player. And, um, and that, that meant that we just slipped away towards the, the, the end of the, that second half of the season. But it was a good year. I scored a few goals and um, one against Chelsea stands out. We, we beat them 4-2 uh, on Boxing Day. 
uh, at uh, the Valley. So that was a, a big game for us. Uh, again, some really good players, some, some good individual players. And it was, um, no, it was a good club, very similar to Ipswich in, in the way that it's a community-based club. Um, fans were, were good and, and got behind us as well. So I enjoyed my time there. Uh, one player that is world-renowned would be Paolo Di Canio. Uh, what was he like to work with and play with? Brilliant. He was... He, he was um, uh, yeah, a character and he was a nightmare at times and he, he wasn't happy if he didn't get a decision in training and five aside someone kicked him and he'd be throwing his arms up in the air and wanting to fight the world and um but he, he was one of the best trainers i've ever seen he was about 35 i think when he was when he joined us and he was at the front of the running he was the first in the training ground he was the last one to leave he um it was a good example i think for for some of the younger players actually to see someone of his talent his ability um, playing at that level and and working as hard as he did, really, uh, I thought he was he was a, a good role model for some of the younger players. As I say, he had his moments, and you just had to put your arm around him and give him a cuddle, and he'd be absolutely fine. Were, were you ever on the end of a, a De Canio hair dryer? No, I got on, I actually got on really well with him. We 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 um, we struck up a good relationship actually because I think you know we, we're both senior players if you like and um both lads that that wanted things done properly you know we wanted we wanted to be professional we wanted to do things the right way um so we had a lot in common in that in that way and we uh, we actually got on pretty well uh, and alan kerbishley was was the boss at the time um there's quite often a, a manager that was linked with with going elsewhere uh how do you manage that were you ever conscious that he might actually leave well, I mean, it came a bit out of the blue when he did leave, to be honest. You know, I think he was part of the furniture at Charlton and been there many, many years. And um, yeah, I guess, you know, you don't think about it really. You just, you're always getting on with your job and you know, you're always thinking about about the next game. You know, you don't, you don't really think long term, to be honest, when you're a footballer. You're, or you think week to week. You know, who is it this week? Who have we got this week? You don't, you don't think, well, four weeks down the line, we've got them or... or um, Curbs has done really well, we might lose him, or Scott Parker's a really good player, we might lose him to Chelsea. You don't think like that, you're just literally thinking game to game. And um, and so it was probably a bit of a shock when he left because he, you know, but he must have looked at it and thought, how far can I take the club? You know, mid table finish, mid table finish, mid table finish, unless he was going to get major, major investment. You know, he must be thinking, well, how am I ever going to get to that next level here? And, and obviously he decided to make the move and, and leave the club. Um, and I think that took a little while for the club to, to deal with as well, because he'd been such a such a stable part of it for, for so many years. Yeah, I mean, some might argue that they're, they're still suffering from that today. Um, I'm just looking at the seasons here. 04, 05 was an 11th place finish. 05, 06, 13th place finish. Um, and then since Kerbishley's gone, we've obviously had relegations and even as far down to League One. Um, so, yeah, towards the end... When he left, it was 06, 07 season, and he went through a flurry of managers with uh, Ian Dowie, I think it was Les Reed and Alan Pardew. Um, certainly under Les Reed's tenure, um, it, at times the, the media really seemed to give him a hard time. Um, were you very aware of uh, all, all the sort of little jokes of Les Reed in the media and uh, fans getting on, on your case? Was that uh, the time? I, I mean, I, just that season, I, I, I think Ian Dow was a little bit unlucky that he didn't get longer. You know, he made quite a few signs in the summer and, you know, it, it was always going to be an adjustment period when Curbs had gone and, and a new manager was coming in. So I felt he, he deserved a bit longer. Uh, Les Reed was part of his coaching staff and I think that counted against him really when he took the job permanently. When, you, when as a group of players, you see a, a, someone as your coach rather than your manager, he, he'd been part of that structure. Um, I think that counted against him. And um, and I think he suffered because of that. Um, and then Alan Pardew came in, and and I think he gave us a lift. Actually, he, he, he was a good manager, Alan, and his training sessions were good, high tempo. And I think I felt when he came in that we had a really good chance of staying up. He because he, uh, he brought a lot of impetus to us. But again, we just fell away at a crucial crucial moment, really, and um, it, we didn't quite make it. But uh, yeah, it was a funny, really funny season when you. It's so unusual when I'd been used to having the same manager for so many years, you know, with George Burley at Ipswich for such a long time, Curbs at Char Charlton for such a long time, and then to have three in, well, three in the space of, you know, I suppose three months, 
we we it was um it was a bit bit weird really was there any ever any conversations around about you getting the manager's job no i no when i le i left i finished 2009 um and and i actually to be honest i thought i was probably going to stay i when when i when the season finished i i had no thought about retiring from football to be honest it wasn't like i was i was thinking i was i was going to finish um, I still thought I was going to play and Phil Parkinson had taken over as manager at the time and he, and he sort of made indications really that he wanted me to stay as well um, but the deal never got done for whatever reason and I, and I wasn't asking for fortunes although you know it wasn't like I was asking for big money particularly um, and, and I ended up sort of not being in dispute with the club but, but you know a bit frustrated that they hadn't come to me with an offer and that's why I, I sort of said to my agent well look i'm not i'm not gonna be traveling in without a contract to, to chart when i was living back here in in essex colchester and so i said there's no point i said i might as well just do a pre-season locally i said and, and keep myself ticking over and if charlton do come up with an offer great um and if not i'll, I'll go somewhere else and so i did i did pre-season at, at colchester um paul lambert actually was in charge he was manager at ipswich now uh funnily enough um and and uh did three weeks and and you know it, it, the mood you know, or the, the offer from Charlton just never materialised. I don't know whether there was, I don't know why, I don't know why, to be honest. I had a few other offers to carry on, um, but not one that I felt was the one for me, really. Uh, I got an offer in September, which if that had come in August, I would have taken. But by that time, I'd, I'd sort of got my head around not playing. I'd got my head um, in, I'd, when I turned 30, I started doing more media work anyway. And so I'd got my, I started getting a few jobs really in the media. I was busy. I was going to games. I was doing lots of stuff, and um, yeah. And I, I just decided that, yeah, that that was probably it for me. I think you know there was no real big goodbye or anything. It was just literally I, I, it fizzled out, and and it, it a bit frustrating because I honestly felt I had another year in me at least. Um, but at the same time, you know, I I, I left them, and it was it was absolutely fine as well. Is it a bit of a, a regret then that you effectively weren't able to say goodbye to the Charlton fans for the last time? No, not really. I mean, I, it's, yeah, it's not it's not about me really. You know, I, um, not something that I'm ever too fussed about, particularly being able to you know say goodbye or anything like that. Um, so no, not not don't regret that so much. I just I just feel like I probably had another year in me, and, it, and, it, and for whatever reason, it didn't quite materialise. Yeah, so then that obviously brings you essentially to retirement um, now. Um, you, you've been doing some work in the media. Um, what next for Matt Holland? What's Where do you see yourself going next? Well, I've been retired a long time now, 11 years. So it's, it's, it's actually longer than, than uh, I think really sometimes as well. I, think, I can't believe it can be that long ago. But in those 11 years, I've been doing loads of media stuff and and still continue to do it I, i've got a contract with the premier league so i uh, they've got their own tv channel and they they provide commentary for all the games abroad um so whilst they sell the rights here in england to sky and bt um all the matches go out to a worldwide audience and i'm part of the the coverage we have some brilliant commentators jim proudfoot and peter drury a part of the team um and, and a number of ex-players myself included who provide the commentary and some tv shows for the premier league so i've got a contract with them uh, i do lots of stuff for talk sport as well and um generally i work i don't know about three three to four days a week doing doing various bits and pieces so it's um it's quite a good balance really i think you, there's always a bit of me thinks what if in terms of being a manager and there's always a bit of you thinks well i should have had a go maybe but uh it's that's a 24 hour day seven day a week job it, it i mean i'm going gray now but i'd have been i'd have been gray by now if i'd have been a manager and i'd have been divorced as well because it, you you take it home with you and it, and um so i've got a nice balance now and i can have a weekend off if i want a weekend off i don't have to you know i don't have to say oh well i can't um, We've got Macclesfield this week. I can't go to the game because I'm going to go and have a holiday. But at least now I can. So it's uh, it's not all bad. Um, there's a bit of you th always. There's always a bit of you that thinks that what if I'd had a go. But at the same time, I'm 11 year years retired uh, and and still working in football. So I can't complain too much. Well, well, thank you very much, Matt. It seems like a good a good point to the, to end, as in this current day in in your life.
Um, and I really appreciate having you on and I can't wait to share this with everybody. No, I hope it, I hope it was all all right. And uh, I hope a you know, quick message to everyone. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Look after yourselves. Uh, hopefully it's not too long before we're, we're back at football matches as well. And um, yeah, we, we look forward to things getting back to normal.